They speak Chinese in China, right? What are you doing? You're doing what? You're doing what? You're doing what? You're doing what? Turns out that Chinese isn't even a language. So what do they speak in China? Well, the truth is far more complex than you ever imagined, and for some reason, well, it makes people giggle. <laughs> the official languages of China are all of these, but don't let that fool you. China has so many languages that they are divided into. Groups. The main ones all fit into a group called Chinese because they share this writing system. You know the one. Not that all Chinese people write like this, though, as you will see. So place your bets in the comments, please. How many languages are spoken in China? No cheating. Umbrella. Yu san. Yu san. Zhe. Zhe. Ho suan. What is so funny? Well, they were all saying the exact same word. Apparently, yep. Chinese is just a general term for all of the languages. So how does it work? Well, there are two major groups: Mandarin and all the rest. Then the whole lot is divided into seven to ten subgroups and lots of sub sub groups. Is that even a word? And we definitely can't forget all of the minority languages that come from other language families. <sighs> But why all the division in the first place? Why can't China just speak one language, Chinese? China, you see, is huge. It's 9.6 million square kilometers on the Earth. It never used to be a united country, though. For thousands of years, it was ruled by various dynasties, lasting till 1911. And this gigantic piece of Earth was full of mountains and rivers. So people of different regions were cut off from their neighbors, which means they literally never heard each other speak. The more years that went by, the more differently people spoke. And today, well, we have a whole bunch of Chinese languages. And I speak English, Mandarin, and、uh, my own dialect, which is one of Jiangxi dialects. But it's not so popular because、um, only people from my hometown can understand. And that's like around three hundred thousand people. Amazing. Of course, lots of people can understand some other languages, but most only understand dialects from their own area. How are you? We're in Chinese. We will say, "How are you?" Ah, how are you? And then, how are you? And then, how are you? 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 The government wasn't too worried about this before 1949, but in 1955, Mandarin was chosen as the official language of China, and everyone is supposed to learn it. But do they? Well, we will have to find out. So, how many languages did you guess China has? Well, if you guessed 302, you are the lucky winner. Although that is not counting the many varieties of each individual one, but I don't want to cause too much confusion just yet. By the way, in China, they refer to these different languages as dialects. This is more a matter of politics than linguistics, so we will steer well clear of that and onto the languages. 用普通话怎么说？普通话，普通话，普通，普通话，普通话。It is said that the mean accent changes with every three miles that you travel. Isn't that amazing? And apparently quite amusing too. Min Chinese is also called Fujianese, which you may have heard of, and they speak it in Fujian Province, in Taiwan, and also in parts of Southeast Asia. There is something rather strange about Min dialects. People can't understand each other from one village to the next. It's also the only Chinese language that is so old. It came from 5,000-year-old ancient Chinese, whereas all the other Chinese languages come from Middle Chinese. Yeah, and the kind of time when we go to the Hong Kong. One of the Min dialects is Hokkien, and you can even hear it in Indonesia. So, what is up with that? Well, the Fujian people were the very first Chinese to mass migrate out of 16th-century China. So now there are Hokkien speakers in many parts of Asia. They share a lot of words with the Indo-Malay indigenous people. What is an easy word to compare Hokkien and Mandarin? Well, how about the word for tea? Same writing. Totally different pronunciation. There is a story that during the tribal wars, Hokkien speakers were saved from extinction because they used to hide in the sugar plantations. Rumor has it that the best stories are hiding in plain sight. And if you want to find those stories, well, you should click these three buttons here, and they will magically come to you, courtesy of the YouTube algorithm. Most Gan speakers live in this area in the southeast. We don't know that much about their early origins because at the time of the Shang Dynasty, they lived very cut off from the influence of the rulers. But these days, there is a lot of influence from Mandarin because they live so near to Mandarin speakers. There are at least 
nine dialects of Gan, and Gan speakers still use some ancient words and expressions that you will hardly ever hear in Mandarin. By the way, many of these languages have extra names, like this ancient name for Gan. It means Right River language, and it got the name because most of the speakers lived south of the Yangtze River, beyond the right-hand bank. You see? It isn't used so much now, but at least you have one more random fact to impress your friends with at your next dinner party. Actually, ask your friends if they know how many dialects Mandarin has. That is a wild one. Lang lang li li. Lang lang li li. So hopefully when I have cleaned my room, then it would be very lang lang li li. When I have washed my hair, it would be very lang lang li li. The Hakka are a group of Han Chinese living in the hills of these regions here and many other parts of southern China. Their language is made up of 13 different dialects. If you want to try and imagine how war and migration shaped the languages of China, well, the history of the Hakka people can show you. Listen to this. The word Hakka actually means guest families, and it's actually a Cantonese word. See, a long time ago, during the wars in the north, Chinese refugees ran away to hide in the Cantonese provinces, and so the Cantonese people gave them this name, Hakka, which meant that they were guests. <laughs> One beautiful thing that reflects Hakka culture is their folk songs, like this song which parents teach to their kids. Mountain singing was a way to socialize at the end of a hard day. See, they lived in very hilly places and used to sing to each other in a high voice so that the sound would carry. They'd also sing to tell stories about the great migration. Hakka dancers would wear a rodent skin on their head while dancing around. Sounds like a lot of fun. It was once banned, actually, but then they kept doing it in secret anyway, because, well, what a silly thing to ban. But there's another Chinese language coming up later that also has a fascinating music tradition. Yes, you have heard of Mandarin, of course, the biggest Chinese language of all. It is the national language, in fact, and 71% of Chinese people speak it. But did you know that there are so many ways to speak Mandarin that people often struggle to understand each other, even in the same province? And that's because Mandarin has 93 dialects, and this is not even a joke. The reason is that Mandarin covers a huge territory and it's got tons of influence from other languages, especially along borders. The northern people live close to Altaic language speakers like these, and in the south they are closer to Thai languages. But 71% means Mandarin is almost a lingua franca in China, right? Well, that's right, with the exception of these 400 million people. Here's an interesting story. The modern version of Mandarin is actually based on the way people speak in a small city called Luanping, about 100 miles from Beijing. Some say it is the purest Mandarin of all. Linguists went there in the 1950s to collect voice samples of the local speech and used that to standardize Mandarin pronunciation. It's amazing how they just chose this one place. Cantonese is the language that they speak in Hong Kong and parts of the southern mainland, and it is completely different from Mandarin. You notice with Cantonese, people often add at the end of a sentence this ah uh, sound. If you listen to people like in Chinatown, you're like, what kind of Chinese is this? And you hear people like, <gasps> I really know, sound like, like this. And, uh, it's all this kind of, uh, uh, you know, and uh, it's like a sing song. And you're like, oh, that's Cantonese. And then if you people, if you hear people adding r to the end of words, like, uh, <laughs> That is uh, Northern, uh, that's northeastern, Northeastern, yeah, northeastern. Beijing dialect or Northeastern Mandarin. Well, there you go. Cantonese is the most well-known dialect of the Yu languages, and sometimes the whole language family itself is called Cantonese. What's cool about Cantonese is it still uses a lot of ancient Chinese features, and it is hung on to the old classical Chinese writing system. It's also more complex than Mandarin. For one, Mandarin has four tones, and Cantonese has up to nine tones, depending on who you ask. That means it's pretty hard to learn compared to Mandarin. If you're ever looking for some culture in Hong Kong, by the way, this is quite a big deal. And if you're enjoying this story, well, the whole channel is full of stories about language learning, but stories don't stop there, because here at Story Learning, I actually teach languages through story too. And the reason I do that is that stories are the best way that I've found to learn 
any language because stories are how we learn naturally. It's how we learn our first languages. And we can use stories to learn a new language like Mandarin Chinese too, which is exactly how I teach here at Story Learning. And if you'd like to learn more about how this works, I've put together a story learning kit that's completely free and it shows you how to learn languages through the power of stories. If you're curious, check it out below. There's a link in the description and claim your free story learning kit. You'll mostly hear this lovely language on the coast near Shanghai. But if you hear people calling it Shanghaiese, well, that's wrong. It is just Wu. Shanghaiese is just one dialect of Wu, which has been important since the 5th century. But it really started to shine during the Ming Dynasty when Shanghai became more politically and geographically important. People who speak other Chinese languages think of Wu as a soft, light and flowing language. And it has a, a lovely nickname. People call it the tender language of Wu. Maybe this is because they've never heard of this particular dialect, the one named the devil's language and the living fossil. It is so eccentric that it's not mutually intelligible with any other dialect of Wu or any other Chinese language. So it's not exactly a Chinese lingua franca. Did you know that China has a tropical zone? That's right, and one gorgeous sunny place is the Hunan province in the south. Now, people there speak Xiang, which has five dialects. This was the language that the famous Chinese Communist Revolutionary Chairman Mao spoke, by the way. The newer version of Xiang has lots of Mandarin influence, while the old kind is a little like Wu that we saw a little bit earlier. Now, apparently, Xiang women used to have their own writing system that men could not read. What do you think of that, ladies? Next is my favorite part, but I just want to mention these three language groups. They have fewer speakers than the others, but many linguists count them in. China has many minority languages that are not called Chinese because they are descended from other language families like Turkic or Mongolic, but they are pretty awesome and over 100 of them are actually considered endangered. These are the Evenki people, mostly living in the far north of China. They are traditionally reindeer herders. And how's this for interesting? In China, they write with the Latin or Mongolian alphabet, but across the Russian border, they write the same language in Cyrillic. This is a very famous song, and you're about to hear why. In this province lives the biggest ethnic group of all, the Zhuang people. They have something wonderful, their own goddess of song. And as her descendants, Zhuang people love singing quite a lot. I will explain that in just a moment. Now, some linguists say there are 36 varieties of Zhuang languages, each related to different Thai language groups. That's 36 right there. Their writing is interesting because they use Latin letters and for the tones, they add on one of these five letters to the ends of words. So if you see an X at the end of a word, it means it gets the falling tone. There is a popular sentence that people use to remember the six tones. Teach thee to climb on a horse to cross a river. Weird, but fascinating. They actually used to have their own writing system, which they'd used for more than a thousand years. How things change. Anyway, one of the Zhuang legends is about the goddess of song called the third sister Liu. Now, Liu was a legendary folk singer and her songs were so melodious and touching that she was called the song fairy. But Envy was around the corner and she was put to death. It's amazing how many of these language stories end in death. Well, there is a lot more envy to come in the astonishing history of the Chinese languages. And luckily, I've already made a video about it. So click this link now and enjoy.